Assalamualaikum and good afternoon. My name is Siti Nur Aina Nazira binti Abdul Halim. With my team, Muhammad Shafiq Irfan, Muhammad Hizri and one Muhammad Faiz bin Wan Zikonai. Today, we'll be discussing the adaptations to anaerobic training program. So, usually anaerobic training, as we all know, is characterized as high intensity with intermittent bouts of exercises that would require the adenosine triphosphate or ATP PCR. Basically, the anaerobic energy system works in the absence of oxygen and it is categorized into two systems which is anaerobic electric system or ATP PCR and also anaerobic lactic system or glycolytic system. The anaerobic energy system provides the body with explosive short-term energy without the need for oxygen. It is stored in the cells in the chemical adenosine triphosphate or ATP. To continue long-term adaptations in response to anaerobic training, specifically related to the characteristic of the training program. If you are going to look in the table presented here, Adaptations such as muscular strength, power, hypertrophy, and endurance can be achieved through resistance training, power in general, plus motor skill development and whole body coordination can be developed through supplemental training programs to resistance exercises such as pyometrics and SAQ drills. The aerobic system or the oxidative system generally has limited involvement in high intensity anaerobic activities but it does play an important role in the recovery of energy stores during periods of low intensity exercise or rest there are a variety of physical and physiological adaptations reported following anaerobic training and these changes enable individuals to improve athletic performance standards these include neural muscular and connective tissue adaptation and we are going to discuss each of these as we move along the presentation. The changes seen in these different aspects range from the early phase of training usually in the first to fourth week of training or up to the following years of consistent training. As a sports science practitioner, understanding how the individual system respond to anaerobic training actually provides knowledge and understanding on how we can plan and predict the outcome of a specific training program. Hi, Assalamualaikum. My name is Wan Muhammad Faiz bin Wan Zikrunai. I'm from RSR 2454A. My metric number is 2021-513707. Okay, now let's start with neural adaptations. Many anaerobic training programs put emphasis on muscular speed and power as an expression of maximal performance. So the parameter looking at the speed and power of movement and these two parameters greatly depend on the optimal neural recruitment. Anaerobic training has the potential to develop long-term adaptations starting from the higher brain centers going down to the level of individual muscle fibers. As what was mentioned earlier, neural adaptations are fundamental to optimizing athletic performance and increasing the neural drive maximizes muscular strength and power. Now let's discuss the central adaptation in the neural muscular system. Motor unit is comprised of the motor neuron and muscle fiber it inhibits. An increase in motor unit activation begin in the higher brain center where they intend to produce maximum level of muscular force and power which in turn causes motor cortex activity to increase as well. Motor cortex is the region in the brain which is involved in the planning, control and execution of voluntary movement to make it simpler to understand how important is the motor cortex. When an injury damages the primary motor cortex, the person will typically present with poor coordination of movements and poor dexterity. So coordination in terms of cross movement skill and usually loses the ability to perform fine motor movements. So when we say fine motor movements, 
that will involve the muscle of the hands, fingers and wrists. When a greater level of force is needed to perform a specific movement or skill or when a new movement is learned, the primary motor cortex activity is elevated in order to support the enhanced need for neuromuscular functions. This is very important especially if the individual you are training is considered beginning in anaerobic training or when the exercise technique experience is very low. That is why individual during the initial sessions of the training program often have difficulty executing a specific movement that you want them to perform. It's because they are not yet accustomed to the movement and another reason is they need to develop neuromuscular functions. That is why as the individual becomes consistent with the training sessions, you will see improvement in terms of executions and coordination basically because of enhanced motor cortex activity and neuromuscular functions. During anaerobic training, recruitment of fast twitch motor units has been shown to be elevated as a mean to support heightening levels of force output. This is commonly seen in untrained individuals in which their ability to maximally recruit motor unit is limited. In untrained individuals or those rehabilitating from injuries, based on research, they saw the ele electrical stimulation has been shown to be more effective than voluntary muscle activations in creating beneficial gains. This actually detects the potential inability of these individuals to successfully activate all available muscle fibers. Based on the research, only 71% of muscle tissue is activated during maximal efforts in untrained populations. Based on exercise physiology, the motor unit is the functional unit of the neuromuscular system. A motor unit may innervate less than 10 muscle fibers for small, intricate muscle or more than 100 muscle fi fibers for large, powerful trunk and limbs muscle. If you want maximal force to be exerted for a given movement or skill, all the available motor unit must be activated. For example, comparing assistant exercise and structural exercise. Bicycle is considered to be an assistant exercise while barbell squats is considered to be a structural exercise. Since in bicycle you don't need to be too much on force to counteract the effect of the dumbbell being lift, therefore you don't need to activate all the motor unit available. For squats, since you need a greater force output, especially if you are doing 1RM barbell squats, basically all motor units must be activated in order to exert maximal force. Another firing rate or frequency of motor unit affect force generation. An increased frequency of firing of motor units means greater force output is generated. This reflects the summation, summation of success, successive muscular contractions. It has been observed that after heavy resistance training, the firing rate of motor unit improve. The factors that affect the improvement in maximal strength and power is an increase in re recruitment of motor unit, increased rate of firing, greater synchronization of neural discharge, and combination of all these factors. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Muhammad Shafi Irfan and I will talk about muscular adaptation. Muscular adaptation on anaerobic training, I'm sure you'll be more familiar with the terms and process in this section. Skeletal muscle adaptation following an anaerobic training happen in both structure and function. We report change in compressing, increase in size, fiber type, transition and enhanced biochemical and ultrastructural component which includes muscle architecture, enzyme activity and substrate concentration. 
Muscle hypertrophy is the term given to enlargement of muscle fiber cross-sectional area following training. There is a positive relationship between hypertrophy and force output. Biologically speaking, the process of hypertrophy involves an increase in the net growth of the contractile protein actin and myosin within the myofibril, as well as an increase in the number of myofibril within a muscle fiber. The new myofilaments are added to the periphery or sides of the myofibril and result in an increase in diameter. The cumulative effect of this addition in an enlargement of the fiber and, collectively, the size of the muscle or muscle group itself. In terms of protein synthetic rates, protein synthetic rates are elevated after acute resistance exercise and remain elevated for up to 48 hours. The magnitude of increased protein synthesis depends on a variety of factors including carbohydrate and protein intake, amino acid availability, timing of nutrient intake, mechanical stress of the weight training workout, muscle cell hydration levels, and the anabolic hormonal and subsequent receptor response. The pattern of neural stimulation detects the extent to which fiber, fiber type adaptation occur following an aerobic training. Muscle fiber are theoretically positioned on a continuum from the most oxidative to the least oxidative type. Just to be clear, muscle, muscle fiber are usually categorized into three. Type 1 or the slow twitch, type 2A and type 2B. But because of the myosin ATP staining, scientists were able to identify and categorize several muscle fiber types. The, the slowest fiber, type 1C, and staining characteristic more like those of type 1 fiber. Whereas the, fa the faster fiber, type 2AC, stains more like type 2A. Type 2AB fibers has intermediate staining characteristic between type 2A and type 2B fibers. These divisions are based on the intensity of staining at different pH levels, and as such, any given fiber could be grouped differently. Finite muscle has fascicle attached obliquely to its tendon. Angle of finition affects to the to the force production capability as well as the range of motion of a muscle. Larger finition angles can also accommodate greater protein deposition and allow for greater increase in CSA. This is training, increased angle of Pination in pinnate muscle. Therefore, increasing the force of produced by the muscle, in addition, fascicle length has been shown to be greater in strength trained athlete. This architectural change has a positive effect on the manner in which force is ultimately transmitted to tendons and bones. Next, I will talk about connective tissue adaptation. Bones, tendons, ligaments, fascia, and cartilage are examples of connective tissue. An aerobic exercise imparts mechanical force that cause deformation of specific regions of the skeleton. So, how does bones adapt to mechanical stress brought about by resistant training? The force created by muscular contraction on the bone insertion can be bending force, compressive force, or torsional force. In response to mechanical loading, osteoblasts migrate to the bone surface and begin bone modeling. The osteoblasts manufacture and secret protein, prim primarily the collagen molecules that are deposited in the space between bone cells to increase strength. This protein form the bone matrix and eventually become mineralized as calcium phosphate crystal, which is hydrocepatite. New bone formation occurs pr predominantly on the outer surface of the bone, increasing diameter and strength. Force generated by the increase in muscle contraction also increase the mechanical stress on bone. 
and the bone itself increase its mass and strength to provide an adequate support. So, any increase in muscle strength or mass will result in increased bone mineral density or the quantity of mineral deposit in a given area of the bone. So, during resistance training or exercise, muscle added by way of hypertrophy by the skeletal system as well. This is the reason why it either in a horizontal or vertical direction, our body can accommodate the load imposed on it. On the other hand, physical activity or immobilization has the opposite effect and result in a faster rate of flows of bone matrix and bone middle density. Numerous studies have shown a positive correlation between bone mineral density and muscle strength and muscle mass. Researchers has reported the resistant trained athlete has higher bone mineral density than sedentary individuals. In some individuals, physical activity seems to influence bone mass, area, and why more than bone mineral density. Therefore, it is already given that anaerobic exercise in general can stimulate muscle hypertrophy strength, and bone growth. Approximately, bone adaptation takes place around 6 months or longer and depends on the structure of the program. But the process of bone adaptation begins within the first few workouts. The primary structural component of all connective tissue is the collagen fiber. The primary stimulus for growth of tendons, ligaments, and fascia are the mechanical force created during high intensity exercise. The degree of tissue adaptation appears to be proportional to the intensity of exercise, which means high intensity exercise will create high cognitive tissue adaptation, while lower intensity exercise will create a lower adaptation for cognitive tissue. Another, an Arabic exercise that exceeds the three hole of strain has a positive effect on stimulating cognitive tissue changes. Evidence suggests that cognitive tissue must increase their functional capabilities in response to increased muscle strength and hypertrophy. The sites where cognitive tissue are, can increase strength and load bearing capaci capacity are on the following as presented here in the slide. So, as muscle becomes stronger, they pull on their bone attachment with greater force and this is assume an increase in bone mass at the tendon bone junction and along the line over which the force are distributed. High intensity and aerobic training also result in cognitive tissue growth and other structural changes that enhance force transmission. There are specific changes that happen within a tendon and that contribute to its increase in size and strength which increases the tendon's ability to withstand greater tensional forces. Recent studies have shown that tendon stiffness or the force transmission per unit of strength or tendon elongation increase as a result of resistant training. In fact, research has reported a 50% to 19% increase in Achilles tendon stiffness following 8 weeks of resistance training. The intensity of exercise is critical as heavy loads, 80% of 1RM increase tendon stiffness but light load, 20% of 1RM do not. Cartilage, as you learn in your anatomy class, is a dense connective tissue that is capable of withstanding considerable force without damage to its structure. The main function of cartilage are the following which is first, provide a smooth joint articulating surface, second, act as a shock absorber for force direct through the joint, and the third, aid in the attachment of cartilage tissue to the skeleton. Two primary types of cartilage are significant in relations to physical activity. Hyaline 
cartilage which is articular cartilage is formed on the articulating surface of bones fibrous cartilage is a very tough form of cartilage found in the intervertebral disc of the spine and the and at the junction where tendons attach to the bones. Since articular cartilage gets its nutrient supply via the division from synovial fluid, this provides a link for joint mobility to joint health. Immobilization of a joint prevents proper diffusion of oxygen and essential nutrients throughout the joint. This results in the death of the healthy cell within cartilage. Current research indicates that human cartilage undergoes atrophy or thinning when external loading is removed. However, the effects of an increased loading on average cartilage thickness remain to be fully explained. That's all for me. Thank you for listening. Assalamualaikum.